This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Today we have uh, the pleasure to welcome with us uh, uh, Barbara Hiltman, who is the curator of Greek and Roman coins uh, at the Musée Cantonal and Archaeologie et Histoire in uh, Lausanne, Switzerland, and a PhD candidate in Archaeology and Sciences of Antiquity at the University of Lausanne. A uh, research ranges from the late antique, uh, the late sorry, Hellenistic coinages of Asia Minor, with a specific interest uh, in Mark Antony's impact on the area's monetary systems, to the adaptation of Celtic monetary systems to Roman dominion in the late Republic and early Empire. Her 2023 monograph, Lestis Sofor de Marc Antoine. Uh, represent the most complete study for this interesting coinage, the change forever, and of course we'll hear more about it, the iconography and the metrology of this coinage. She has also published on the important Gallo-Roman hoard of Ivan Mundani, the coinage of the Frisian cities of Acumonea, Eumenea, and Eucarpea, and the involvement of women in the monetary production in the eastern and western provinces in the Roman Empire. So please uh, join me in welcoming Barbara. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you, Lucia. So um, hello, everyone. First of all, uh, I would like to really thank uh, Lucia Carbone for inviting me to give a lecture for the American Numismatic Society Long Tables. It is with a great pleasure that I will speak to you today about Anthony's Sistophory, uh, which are coins that I started to study quite a few years ago for my master thesis in uh, 2015. I choose this coinage because I liked the fact that it is related to the numismatics both of the Hellenistic period and of the Roman Republic. These denominations were introduced under the Attalid and they continued to be minted by the Roman when the territory became a province. My choice was also focused on Antony's Sistophory because there had been no detailed study of them. Unlike Sistophory from earlier and later periods, for which there were corpora published in the 70s or 80s. The work by uh, Kleiner and Noe on Attalid Sistophory, the one of uh, Sutherland on Sistophory of Augustus, and that of Metcalf on the Sistophory of Adrian. To these publications must now, of course, be added the recent work by Lucia Carbone about the late Sistophoric production and the book of um, William Metcalf about late Republican Sistophory. The goal of my um, research was to place the coins at the heart of the analysis in order to put them into the historical, political, military, and economic context. To this end, the work by François de Calaté on the history of the Mithridatic Wars seen through the coins published in 1997, inspired me very much as the authors used numismatic material as a primary historical source with the goal of supplementing and or qualifying the discourse of literary and epigraphic sources or even sometimes replacing them. So after defending my master thesis, I met Michel Amandry who encouraged me to expand my corpus so as to publish my research. He also gave me all the material that he had collected about Anthony's Sistophory in 1992, when he was working on the Roman Provincial Coinage I. He also proposed that I contacted the publisher Ozonius in order to submit my book for the collection Numismatica Antiqua. And last year, the book was finally published there, uh, 10 days after the birth of my daughter. So it was quite um, particular months. <laughs> uh, the heart of my research is therefore based on the corpus that I gathered. A total of 836 systophory were analyzed, 
nearly 50% of type 1, uh, which correspond to RPC1 um, 2201, and 50% uh, of type 2, which is RPC1 200, uh, no, 2202. My corpus is therefore balanced, even if the parity between the type 1 and type 2 specimens was not deliberate on my part, but a pure coincidence in collecting, probably um, reflecting the distribution of the minting. My corpus mainly consists of cystophory preserved in uh, public or private collections and of cystophory gathered in old sales catalogs and in more recent auctions on internet. Finally, only a few cystophory come from documented finds. Certain specimens come from orts whose place of discovery is known. Uh, for, for example, the Istanbul ord, um, whose provenance is uh, probably Asia Minor. The Sarnakuk Award, um, who was found in Armenia. And finally, an award that is said to have been found in Asia Minor. And I have also a few specimens that were found in archaeological context, mainly in Asia, especially in the excava excavations at Sardis, and some other isolated finds in Slovenia, Croatia, and Crimea. The fact that there was a there are a few cystophory whose place of provenance is known is in line with the observations of the authors of the RPC who noted that, generally speaking, there is a lack of data for Asia Minor concerning silver monetary fines during the period from the death of Caesar to Vitellius. So when we are talking about coins, we are talking about a high volume project, and it would be certainly possible to add even more items to this corpus. However, I consider that it includes a sufficiently high number of coins and that its nature is sufficiently random. Uh, there is no other representation of coins from awards, for example, so that it can claim to be representative and but not exhaustive, of course. Admittedly, listing more than 800 specimens of an ancient coinage already gave a fairly clear indication of the large number of coins that must have been struck originally. However, to establish this data more securely and precisely, I first had to classify all the coins according to the analysis of their obverse dialings. This enabled me to later apply statistical method to assess the original volume of the coinage. For this classification, I divided each of the two types of cystophory into two subgroups, according to the presence of an A with a broken bar um, in the legends of the obverse, as you can see on this example, uh, or uh, the presence of a regular A, so an A with a horizontal bar uh, in the legends. So, for type 1 and for type 2, we have this uh, difference between uh, the exemplaries. Okay. Even if it is not certain that the better looking specimens with better workmanship were produced among the first coins, I have chosen to organize my coins, starting with the most beautiful obverse dice, which are generally, um, which have generally le larger and massive heads, and to finish with those with very small heads, which are generally less fine. In the four subgroups, coins with large heads and other with smaller heads can be found. And of course, between the very large heads and the very small heads, the coins were classified as much as possible according to the obverse and reverse die links highlighted. And here is the same um, classification table for type 2 coins. As an example, I am now showing you the die links that I observed for the group of cystophory with a type 1 broken bar A. 
out of the 237 coins that were gathered in this group, um, there were 108 obverse dies. More than half of the obverses were used to strike at least two specimens of the sample, and the characteristic characteroscopic index was circa 2.2. Oops, sorry. Um, other obverse dyes are more represented by coins in the sample. For example, I have observed that up to 11 coins were produced using one same um, obverse dye. This dye study also allowed me to make certain important observations by comparing the specimens with each other. First of all, no reverse dye links have been established between cystophory with a broken bar A and uh, those with a regular A. Furthermore, slight differences in the workmanship and in the iconography can be observed between the cystophory with a broken bar A and those with a regular A. For example, heads with very large and robust aspects are rather characteristic of broken bar A coins. One can also mention that the heavy wreath around the portrait of the obverse of the cystophory with a regular A is generally thinner than that on the cystophory with a broken bar A. And finally, generally speaking, I have noted that coins with a broken bar A have a better finished look than those with a regular A. These uh, findings enabled me to put forward an hypothesis about the distribution of the minting. It is probable that the coins were produced by two mints, one responsible for the cystophory with a broken bar A, the other for those with a regular A. These two mints may have been each equipped with two workshops, one producing type 1 cystophory and the other type 2 cystophory. The study of the dye axis and of the weight seems to confirm such a breakdown of the minting. Indeed, coins with a broken bar hay have more often an axis at uh, 360 degrees than coins with a regular A. And the average weight of cystophory with a broken bar A, um, which I calculated 11.59 gram, grams, is a little higher than those with a regular A, uh, which is 11.42 grams. These two means were probably Ephesus and Pergamon, but it is still today difficult to be certain about this and to determine which one was responsible for the production of broken bar A coins and for regular A coins. The cystophory have no mint mark or symbol, and in my opinion, the comparison of their style with other coins clearly struck at Pergamon and Ephesus does not provide any further information. The dye study of Anthony Cystophory allowed me to estimate the number of coins that were originally struck using statistical methods. I not only applied good methods revised by ST, but also the simplified Carter's method. The, the latter method was above all used for comparison. The results obtained were rounded up or down to the nearest hundred for the number of coins. And I made the calculations for every subgroup of coins, as well as for all the type one and type two coins. My idea was to compare the different results achieved as well as possible and to put forward an average. I precise, I precise here that I have considered it realistic to estimate that one obverse die may have been used to mint up to uh, to 20,000 specimens, a number that was reached by François de Calatay, Georges de Perrault and Leandre Villaranga in L'Argent Monnayé d'Alexandre Le Grand Auguste. And before going any further, I would, also, um, I would also like to remind you that what counts more 
and the results obtained is not the final estimation of the number of coins, but the upper limit obtained. Indeed, this limit makes it possible to situate the upper threshold beyond which the estimation is no longer plausible. Hence, by merging and rounding the result to uh, 50,000 coins, I established that a maximum of between 8 million and 300,000 systophory and 12 million 750,000 systophory may have been produced by Anthony. To better understand this result, I converted them into denarii, talents, and ton of silver. I considered that one Sistophorus was worth three denarii at that time, an exchange rate that was supported under Augustus and which seems to be confirmed under Antony in light of the average weight that I calculated for the Sistophory, 11.64 grams, and the average weight of three denarii, three contemporary denarii, uh, which uh, corresponds to 11.7 grams. I carried out the conversion into tons of silver by considering that one Antonian Sistophorus consists of 10.48 grams of silver, as its fineness is around 90%. In consequence, it is certain that the two types of Antony Sistophory were minted on a very large scale. But for what reason and for whom were they produced in such vast quantities? As coins were one of the favored media for conveying the official discourse of power towards a defined audience in words and images, uh, which can be called propaganda, it seems to me that the very special typology of Anthony's Sistophory may provide some answers. To better interpret the messages transmitted by these coins, it is now essential to briefly place them in their historical and numismatic context. Firstly, the minting of the Sistophory took place in the context of the reorganization of the Eastern Roman provinces by Antony who was then triumvir with Octavian and Lepidus. He was also there to prepare a campaign against the Parthians, who attempted to seize Asia Minor, Syria, and Cilicia. With this goal, he went to Asia in 41 BC and entered Ephesus, where he was acclaimed Neos Dionysus, according to the ancient authors. Whether he wanted this acclamation or not, it gave him a status as a new benefactor and protector of the Asian people. While reorganizing the Roman East, he met Cleopatra at Tarsus in Cilicia and joined forces with her to bring together as many forces as possible to fight the Parthians. In early 40, also he wanted to return to Asia because the Parthians were becoming more and more threatening. He had to return in Italy because of the Parisian war, which was waged by his wife, Fulvia, and his brother, Lucius Antonius, against Octavian. When he arrived at Brindisi, he learned that Fulvia had died of illness in Sicilian, where she had taken refuge. According to Plutarch, this unexpected death facilitated the reconciliation between Antony and Octavian. A new alliance was concluded and was sealed by the marriage of Antony to Octavia, the sister of Octavian. There was a hope that there would be a return to peace and permanent reconciliation of the Caesarian faction. Undoubtedly after Brindisi in September 40, Antony sent his lieutenant Publius Ventius Bassius to the east to carry out a campaign against the Parthian. He himself was only able to live in the spring of 39 after putting an end to the blockade of the Italian peninsula that had been set up by Sextus Pompey. 
a new pact was concluded between the three men at Misenium, and Antony fi finally traveled to the east with his new wife. On their way, they stayed in Athens during the winter of 3938, where they may have been received as a couple of Ewardetic gods. It was probably at that time that the minting of the Sistophory started, on which Antony appeared next to his new wife and bore the title of consul for the second and third time, which he obtained at Misenium. The issues of Sistophory certainly started in the summer of 39, after Ventidius had pushed back the Parthian from Asia. Also, he did not permanently defeat them. Antony may have given a written order to his legate or to the governor of the province to mint coins in his name. He returned to Asia in 38 and participated with Ventidius in the siege of Samosata against the king of Comagen, who was an ally of the Parthian. But he had to return to Italy once again in 38 due to a disagreement with Octavian. They finally reconciled at Tarentum in 37, mainly due to an intervention by Octavia. The Triumvirate was renewed for five years and a new division of the army and fleet was agreed upon. Antony returned to the east and it was not only until 36 that he launched his major offensive against the Parthians together with Octavia, uh, Cleopatra, <laughs> sorry. And secondly, in order to understand the typology of Antony's Sistophory, I will now, I will now present these silver denominations uh, that you may uh, already know, but just to remind some important aspects. Uh, they were introduced by the Atalids in the second century BC. The exact date is still debated today by numismatists. Their name comes from the sista, the woven basket, that appears on their obverse. There were lighter coins than Attic tetradrachm, which then mostly circulated in the eastern Mediterranean. But it may be supposed that they were exchanged at the same price which was an overvaluation that gave the Atalid state a significant financial gain. The limited circulation of these coins in the Atalid kingdom, which is confirmed by the monetary fines, seems to indicate that the kings implemented a monetary monopoly. Sistophory were above all struck at Ephesus and Pergamon, but also at Tralles, Laodicea, and Apamea. The monetary issues were certainly under the control of the kings, even if neither their portraits nor their names appeared on these coins. The Sistophoris typologies refer not only to Heracles, with the quiver between the two snakes that is on their rivers, but mainly to Dionysus, with the presence on the obverse of the Hivy Wreath and of the Sista, a basket used in Dionysiac ceremonies. The serpent um, can refer to the Menads Menad, and to the Medes, according to which Dionysus was first born from Zeus and Persephone, after Zeus seduced the goddess in the form of a snake. The links to Dionysus and Heracles are significant, as they enabled the Atalids to continue the tradition of, the, of Alexander the Great, who himself was compared to Dionysus and Heracles for his eastern conquest and for the spreading of Greek civilization to this distant land. When the Roman took control of the Atalid kingdom in 133 BC, they did not impose their own coins, but they authorized the minting of systophoric issues while controlling them. The example of the Mithridatic Wars confirms this. The Romans had every interest in keeping this overvalued coinage 
whose typology remained practically unchanged until 58 BC, when Latin legend appears, appeared that designated the governors of the province and the central symbol between the two serpents on the rivers was sometimes modified. As was the case under the Attalids, Sistophory continued to circulate only in Asia Minor. In 39, Antony differentiated himself by consider considerably modifying the iconography of the Sistophory. His head and his wife's head, Octavia, were displayed on them and the inscriptions were totally written in Latin, stressing the Roman authority that was embodied by him. However, the Dionysiac iconography was maintained, as is evidenced by the heavy wreath on the head of the triumvir and the one uh, that is on the border of the obverse of type 1. The Sista moved to the reverse, sometimes under the portrait of Octavia, and sometimes under a representation of Dionysus standing, holding a Tirsus and a Cantarus. This typology is a real Romano-Hellenistic fusion, even if the portraits of the kings cannot be found on earlier Sistophory, the representation of kings, and especially of the royal couple on coins, was typical of the Hellenistic East. This kind of representation certainly influenced the appearance of the portrait on Roman Republican coins. Also, this innovation was also a logical development of the Roman Republican monetary typology, which first presented the portrait of divinities, then of distant and closer ancestors, and finally of living people, uh, Caesar being the, the first one. But until uh, Antony's Sistophory, no Roman had ever dared to have himself represented with the attributes of a god. However, attributing divine characteristics to a leader, here those of Dionysus, was also part of the means of representing Hellenistic power. And finally, let's stress on the fact that these coins present for the first time a Roman woman on a coinage clearly struck by a Roman authority. As we will see, she had a prominent strategic and complementary place on them. Therefore, Antony was presented on Sistophory with the feature of Dionysus beside his new wife. Of course, it is possible that the continuation of a Dionysiac typology was above all a means to enable users to identify the denomination as Crawford suggested in the 70s. However, if Anton or his staff validated such an iconography, it certainly reflected the propaganda developed by Anthony, particularly in the East. Firstly, assimilating Anthony with Dionysus was in line with the propaganda that had been well built up and that was known to everyone at the end of the Roman Republic, that of the Imitatio Alexandri. The Hellenistic kings and then the Roman imperatoress attempted to imitate Alexander the Great, with Alexander himself following in the traces of the conquering and civilizing Dionysus. This message suited Antony very well as he was preparing a campaign against the Parsons. The literary sources, which reflected the Augustan propaganda against Antony, highlight the supposed Dionysiac debaucherie of Antony with Cleopatra. However, as Plutarch tells us, the leader had already been acclaimed Neos Dionysus in spring 41 BC, when he entered Ephesus and therefore before his first meeting with the legit queen at Tarsus. An inscription found in Athens dated from 3938 BC, when Antony and Octavia were staying there, confirms that this assimilation 
assimilation was also current in Greece. The text speaks about the organization of a Panathenaic competition called Antonia in honor of Antony Theou Neu Dionysu. But why was Octavia also represented on Sistophory beside her new husband, Neus Dionysius? Another inscription, also dated to these years and found in Athens, documents the fact that Octavia was also considered as a goddess. Together with her husband, they were honored as Theoi Ewergete with Antony incarnating Dionysius and Octavia probably incarnating Athena. Certain historians, including Robert Fisher in 1999, have put forward the hypothesis that the couple played an active role in the Antesteria, an Athenian festival in honor of Dionysius, during which a sacred marriage, the Hierogamus, took place between Dionysus personified and the wife of the Archon Basileus, who herself was compared to Athena Polias. This festival, which took place at the beginning of the year, was closely related to a return to prosperity and abundance, which clearly corresponds to the hopes expressed during the wedding to, of Octavia to Antony. It should also be noted that the assimilation of Octavia with Athena is insinuated by Seneca, who reports that satirical texts had been written at the foot of statues of Antony, especially including a text that ordered him to get divorced not only from Octavia, but also from Athena to marry Cleopatra. These few elements, therefore, seem to confirm that the assimilation of Antony with Dionysus and the participation of Octavia as a divine wife, perhaps Athena, was um, current in the East. Thus, two main messages were posted on the Sistophory, reinforced by Dionysiac iconography. On one, hand, on one hand, a message of conquest related to Antony's campaigns against the Parthian, and on the other hand, a message of the return to Concordia and prosperity, thanks to his marriage to Octavia. It is interesting to highlight the fact that this propaganda also seems to make it possible to better understand who the Sistophory were aimed at, and why they were produced in such large quantities. It is known that when the Sistophory were minted, Antony was raising troops in the province of Asia. And it is probable that the wages of this man were paid with this silver coins, silver being the prime metal for paying soldiers. The conquering message of Antony Dionysius was therefore certainly addressed to them, and the issues enabled the financing of the campaign. We should not be surprised that the number of Sistophory originally struck was not enough to pay um, 100,000 100, soldiers. All the expenditure related to the army was not necessarily made in currency, and other coins already in circulation may also have been used to pay the troops. Finally, the province of Asia Minor was hit particularly hard during the first century BC, especially because of the Mithridatic Wars and the civil wars, during which the leaders carried out acts of violence against Asian cities. Therefore, the minting of new coins was certainly aimed at boosting the economy of this province. The message of Concordia and prosperity was certainly addressed to the people of Asia. It should also be noted that no Sistophory had been struck for 10 years and that the proconsular issues were not very large. 
there was therefore a great need for new currency in the province of Asia. And before reaching the conclusion of my presentation, I wish to briefly mention two observations that I made by becoming interested in the spreading of the propaganda shown by the Sistophory via other coins issued by Anthony during this period. Firstly, the, the Dionysiac symbolism is totally absent from contemporary issues of Anthony even when he is next to Cleopatra, as you can see on this tetradrachm and on this denarius. This point is in clear contrast with the ancient texts who made Cleopatra the divine wife of Antony Dionysus. These coins seem rather to present Antony as a representative of the Roman Republic. His portrait is sober and bare-headed, without royal or divine attributes, and the legends, the inscriptions that go with it, present the Roman titles and functions that he bore, and reflects his recent victory over Armenia. On the contrary, Cleopatra is clearly depicted as a queen. The inscription shows her royal titles, and she wears the characteristic diadem of Hellenistic royalty. The distribution of their portrait on every side of the coins seem to further stress the political alliance of these two leader, leaders rather than a matrimonial type alliance. Secondly, Octavia not only appears on the Sistophory, but also on Roman array and denarii, and on provincial coins, known as fleet coinage. She is seen with her husband, and also with her brother Octavian, which clearly symbolizes their reconciliation. In this way, the Dionysiac message on the coins seems to be limited to limited to Asia and to the Sistophory, whereas the wider message related to the Concordia between the Triumviri and the return to prosperity was spread all over the Roman territories, as the latter message also served the propaganda of Octavian. So is Crawford's hypothesis validated according to which the Dionysiac references on the Sistophory were kept because they enabled users to identify the coins? In my opinion, it is possible that it was one of the reasons that encouraged Anthony to keep these elements, but this may also have been part of a more subtle discourse of the representation of power as Anthony and or his entourage had certainly validated this typology, which certainly suited them. Furthermore, it had been seen that the general assimilation of Antony with Dionysus in the East is also supported by rare texts and inscriptions. Beyond the purpose and the propaganda of the Sistophory, I would like to finally return to the original volume of Sistophory minted by Anthony uh, that I calculated. I was surprised when I obtained this result and I wondered if such a volume was realistic for a monetary issue made at the end of the Republic in Asia, Asia Minor. To try to answer this, it seemed to me to be relevant to see if, on one hand, the extent of the sums of the sums in coins at the end of the Roman Republic was comparable, and if, on the other hand, the Sistophory means in Asia had the capacity to strike coins on such a scale. Eventually, I tried to determine if there were sufficient silver metal resources for Anthony to be able to have so many of these coins struck. So, 
some numismatic and literary information enabled a response for the first question. In the 70s, already Crawford, by analyzing the dial links of Roman Republican coins, demonstrated that the minting of coins underwent unprecedented growth in the first century BC, especially starting with the issues attributed to Sulla. Crawford obviously relates these very large issues to the payments of the armies. To give an example, nearly 76 um, million denarii were struck during the social war in the year 90. There are also many ancient texts that mention different sums of coins with figures as high as those obtained for Antony Sistafoli. For example, during Caesar's triumph in 46, Appian and Cassius Dio reported that 5,000 denarii were distributed to every legionary, 10,000 to centurions, and 20,000 to prefects and tribunes. As there were 10 legions of 6,000 men to pay, this would represent a distribution of more than uh, 300 million denarii. Theotanius even speaks of 6,000 denarii per man, which shows how much currency was needed. Finally, it should be noted that Antony's legionary issues in 39-31, linked to the financing of the Battle of Axiom, would have led to minting 35 million denarii and 1 million array. So tens of millions and, or even hundreds of millions of denarii were therefore minting at the end of the Roman Republic. Several estimations of the volume of Republican issues of Sistophory have been made in recent years. They, made, they make it possible to understand the production capacity of mints in Asia Minor. The study by François de Calatay about the Mithridatic Wars clearly demonstrated that the mints could greatly increase their annual production according, according to the Roman military operations that needed to be financed. He estimated that during the years from 48 to 78 BC, around 4 million cystophori were produced. This result was even recently reviewed upward, slightly upwards, by Lucia Cardone, following the analysis of a larger co co group of coins. Admittedly, these results are lower than ours, but they concern the first half of the first century BC. However, the situation had changed 40 years later. One can mention, for example, the wages of soldiers, which were doubled under Caesar, leading to further growth in the monetary issues. Finally, a few years after Antony's Sistophory, the number of Sistophory struck by the future Augustus were estimated by Kenneth Arl at approximately 15 million to 20 million uh, coins, using the dye study carried out by Sozon. And finally, concerning the provenance of the silver that enabled Antony to mint coins on such a large scale, it may be recalled that when the triumvir entered Ephesus in 41 BC, he was certainly received as a new benevolent and protective Dionysus. However, the divine honors bestowed upon him certainly reflect a more pragmatic reality. The Asians hoped that they would not have to pay up again um, as they recently had to do for Brutus and Cassius who demanded that they should pay the amount of 10 years of tribute in only two years, which uh, corresponds to um, 16,000 talents. 
As a result of their pleas, Antony acted slightly more clemently, asking only for nine years of tributes in two years, therefore corresponding to uh, 14,400 um, uh, uh, talents, um, which we can also um, which corresponds also to 28 million uh, 800 systophory. Such a sum was certainly mostly paid in gold or silver, whether in currency or not, but also in kind, in wheat, for example. It is certain that it was partly used to mint new coins, perhaps a part of the systophory even it was, if it was also used to pay the soldier as Philippine, as we know. These revenues were obviously not the only resources collected by Antony in the East. He had also gathered a quantity of wealth uh, that had been accumulated by Brutus and Cassius before Philippi. And he had imposed the payment of large sums on free cities and local rulers who supported the Caesar seeds. Therefore, even if certain sums that were recorded by ancient writers are perhaps a little exaggerated, all this information has allowed me to consider that the results um, that are achieved with statistical calculations are realistic for the Antony Sistophory um, minted. And I thank you very much for your attention. And I will now attempt to answer any question you might have. And this is just a um, last uh, slide with all the um, references um, that I quoted during my presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Barbara, for this um, very, very interesting uh, uh, presentation. Of course, I have uh, some questions. If you uh, and of course several other people have questions, if you allow me a moment to share my screen, uh, mm -hmm. I have uh, one of the. So just if you stop, yeah, thank you. So I can share my screen because I want to actually to show you. Sorry, this image. Uh, uh, let's. Ah, yes. I know him. Yeah, can you see it? Sorry, because the only way is that I don't know why. Even sorry that you have to see all my uh, emails. Okay, but think. but <laughs> can you see uh, the image here? It's yes. from uh, the 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 collection of uh, Richard Ballison who asked me to um, to share this with you. And he was interested in this uh, countermark, whether you would expand, you have some ideas whether this counter, what this countermark could see, could mean. Yes, so um, I remember this coin because I have it in my corpus with the, this uh, countermark. Mm -hmm. And uh, indeed, it is very uh, intriguing because uh, there is no parallel that I found. Um, I I don't remember. I talk about this with uh, Michel Amandri and maybe Andrew Burnett too um, about the probable uh, geographical um, mm. uh, possibility. For example, Diracium or Diracium, yeah, another city uh, like that. But um, yes, we didn't uh, found any other uh, countermark similar. So Thank you. probably explaining a, circ uh, a particular circulation, because as I mentioned first, um, at first, uh, I have other systophory uh, isolated finds um, that come from the, um, um, the, ba the, the, the balcon, the mm -hmm. actual. So maybe the rachium could be a, an hypothesis, but I, it's just a probably. Right. Thank you very much. I'll just stop sharing my screen because it's not. But uh, it's, yeah. uh, there is something in uh, my book about this sister for it. So I have more uh, 
text uh, about this coin and this particular country. Okay, so uh, Richard Ballison, uh, I, mean, <laughs> I think that the book, uh, Barbara, Barbara's book would be great. I don't remember the page, but uh, I, am, I am quite sure it is the same. So but... I will check actually the, your book that is now in the ANS library, actually some of the students are seminar students are using your book so <laughs> but if you want to if you want to send me the the image so i can uh, be sure it's the same coin because maybe if it is another one it could be also interesting to to know yeah that's not uh unicum yes mm -hmm. uh before i ask questions are there any other question questions from our audience no. Um, okay. Uh, one thing which is um, interesting. First of all, for I mean, I I totally agree. Uh, just one observation and then uh, and one question. One observation mm -hmm. is the fact that I think that. Uh, you know, I know that we always say this discovery we used to be armies, uh, whatever, I say that. But I do think that in your case, in the case of Anthony, it really is sure. Also because Anthony, and I, I, you mentioned this in your book, and I think it's super important to say this to everybody else, is that uh, Anthony Sistophorus is meteorologically equivalent to three Sistophorus to three denarii. So while for earlier Sistophory, actually the equivalence of uh, uh, one Sistophory three denarii would meant a real loss of silver in every case. Uh, uh, on the contrary, I would say that this case, uh, this makes it uh, sure. But um, um, did you, uh, I mean, I know you put this in your book, and sorry for, for being so uh, precise, asking you so, such precise questions, uh, but... Um, I try to remember. <laughs> no, 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 uh, no, but... Um, uh, Kevin and um, Butcher and Ponting, for example, uh, talk about the bullion uh, used for... Uh, Mark Anthony Sistophori. And, um, and now, uh, with their new project, we know that, for example, so that uh, this is something new, that we know that the silver used for Mark Anthony Sistophori is very different, is, com is a completely different bullion for any other of the Sistophori pre previously used uh, in Asia. So, which means that Mark Anthony must have gotten this bullion apparently somewhere else, uh, or uh, really, we don't know. So this is one more thing uh, for you, I guess, to, to reserve, search, because exactly, but your opponent said that this is of Mark Anthony were, so I don't know, uh, because you think that it comes from the Asian cities, uh, as the other ones, basically. Yes, but maybe in my presentation, I was too general. Uh, I remember uh, that uh, Butcher and Ponting um, analyzed this bullion and coming from um, Kalkiliki. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there is a link uh, between Anthony and uh, Thessaloniki. And uh, we have some uh, proof that he was also um, Acclaim Dionysus, benefactor, uh, everything like this in this region. So maybe he collected uh, the metal there, and not only there, but also elsewhere in the east. And um, maybe the bullion was transported by ships after in Asia to mint this Sistophory. And also um, to add something about the equivalence of one uh, Sistophoru, of Anthony Sistophory, Sistophorus, and three denarii of that time. Uh, it should also be mentioned that um, uh, 
the, 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 the fineness of the um, cystophory is a, a little bit less fine that, than the contemporary denarii. So it's uh, once again uh, more um, uh, advantageous, it's um, more um, advantageous. Uh, advantageous, yes, <laughs> for Anthony to strike cystophory and to pay his armies with these coins uh, rather than uh, with denarii. But after um, we know also that the cystophory, uh, the, the denarii of uh, Anthony uh, clearly uh, show. Um, uh, I can, how to say um, some uh, some uh, miss the, the 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 silver is less and less fine in the denarii. Based. 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 Voilà. So yes, that is probably clearly related related to the army, and yes, to reboot reboosting the economy, but maybe in a second uh, time in a second um, time. So first the soldier and after the, the coins come through the regular circulation of the province. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have uh, other questions? No? I mean, uh, so I, I wish I could show the, your book in presence that usually is in my office, but as that it has been quote unquote stolen by one of our summer students. But otherwise, uh, thank you really for this fantastic uh, long table. Thank you for inviting me. Um, okay. Thank you also for uh, all your help when I was doing my uh, corpus and uh, picture and, uh, of the history of the It anus. was, uh, I mean, as you know very well, I mean, since, uh, since we met, uh, our first meeting in 2016 is, was I mean, it's mutual interest in this case, really. Okay. So, bye-bye, Barbara. Okay, thank bye you very bye much. Bye-bye, everybody. Ciao, ciao. Ciao, ciao.